Hey folks, what's going on? Arm and Hammer here. That right there, that is Justin LoFranco, and welcome back to season two of On the Minute. Now, I don't know why we're calling it seasons, Justin. We did like five episodes and took a little break from holiday, <laughs> but you know what? We're going with it. It's a new year, new season. There you go. There new you go. year, new season. That's easy enough. Well, we have a packed show today. We're going to be talking about the big news that has come out out of CrossFit this week, which is the 2019 CrossFit Games rulebook finally released. And uh, maybe a little bit of a Wadapalooza preview at the end here. So why don't we why don't we jump right into it with the rule book? There were a lot of brand new segments in this rule book. I mean, we saw a huge shift in the format of the CrossFit Games going into the 2019 season from the 2018 season. I mean, you know, welcome to the universe. If if this is the first time that you're hearing about this, I, I mean, I, I just wish I could see your reaction. But the 2019 <laughs> game season is obviously going to be very different. But we've been waiting for a rule book to give us a better idea of exactly how those differences are going to play out. And now we finally have the rule book. Did it give you everything you were hoping for, Justin? Did you learn what you're hoping to learn? Yeah, I think for the most part, it, 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 it tracked along the lines of the broad strokes that that Greg and company had been outlining over the last several months based on conversations that we have been having with them since since the game's news originally broke back in August. And so there wasn't a lot of surprises in here. I think that we were really waiting to codify uh, all of the changes that we've been hearing rumored. And, and it really drills down to the specific things. And so we can, we can touch on that, I think, I think at the start here, which is what happens to national champions, sanctioned event champions or sanctionals champions, and then what happens to the individuals in the top 20 and the backfilling process that goes down from there because that's been the big question and that's the really pertinent question going into Wadapalooza next week. What happens when an athlete wins who's already won or a team in this instance like Invictus who's returning again after winning Dubai? What happens in those scenarios? And so I think that's I think it's the area that's caused a lot of the consternation as well as what defines a national champion. So with that said, Justin, I think let's go ahead and just tackle a couple of these new pieces of information in order. So let's start with nationality. We know now that in order to be a national champion, you have to be a citizen of that country, which is a change from previous yeah. residency requirements. Yes, it is. The citizenship requirement, I think, is probably the best way of doing this, but it does land them in a couple of pieces of gray area, I think. And someone messaged me about this specifically regarding Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is technically Puerto Ricans, American citizens, That's right. but represented on its own with its own flag at the Olympics. So what what happens here? What, what do you think? Uh, what do you think of something like that? Um, that was also an yeah. I think I, I think I probably got an email from the same person that you did, Armin. And so uh, we did, I was just reviewing that earlier today, and I haven't quite digested the full situation. They do use the Olympics as a model for certain things here in CrossFit because it is an international sport with a lot of representation. However, um, I think this is a bit of an unforeseen one. I don't want to say it's one that they've overlooked necessarily because I haven't asked CrossFit yet, but I think this might be an area where it was an unintended consequence of the ruling and how it's playing out. So um, the brief explanation here is, is that um, they usually get international representation to be able to compete sovereignly, but here under these rules, they're going to have to compete as an American citizen, which significantly hampers their chance of qualifying any athlete to the CrossFit Games because the United States is a powerhouse for CrossFit worldwide. So um, I think this is going to kind of negatively affect them, but um, I don't know if they intended it to be that way. My guess is they probably didn't. Do you think there were athletes who, uh, upon hearing the national champion news, moved assuming that residency was going to be the case and now I, find themselves? I, I do. I do. Yeah, I think this is a really good example of this. I think Terry Helgadotter just found herself in Sweden a couple of, uh, about a month ago or so. And I, I remember seeing it on her Instagram post. Um, she, if you guys don't remember, she's an athlete who's a four times CrossFit Games athlete in misqualification, I think, by one or two spots um at the at the europe regional and so um uh you know she i noticed uh, and i think i sent this to you armin a while ago which is like <laughs> 
you know, moving to Sweden and, uh, and, or Switzerland, excuse me, I think it's, I believe it's Switzerland. And so, you know, that's an area and an opportunity where you could say, oh, shoot, this is a really great chance of perhaps not competing against other Icelandic athletes like Danny Thor's daughter, Sarah Sigmund's daughter, and now Katrin David's daughter, um, and, and putting herself in, in the mix uh, against Swedish athletes. So um, that's an area where, unfortunately, unless she has citizenship, which I don't think she does, that she's still going to be competing against Iceland's best. Now, let's go ahead and, and talk about backfilling, because that was another topic that you brought up as one of the biggest questions that we're looking to have answered. And while yeah. we have some answers now, I, I wonder how satisfying these answers are for some people. And just to give a quick recap of exactly how the backfilling works, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Justin, basically what we're seeing is if someone is earning a spot via the official CrossFit Games channels, national championship and top 20 in the World Wide Open, and they're unable right. to take their spot. If they're a national champion, that's it. It's done. There is no that's backfilling it. that national champion spot. No backfilling at but all. But if you're that's in the correct. top 20 and you're a national champion, they will backfill that top 20 spot. And that's again, correct. based off of conversations that both you and I have had with CrossFit HQ, the top 20 World Wide Open qualification spot is really meant as a stopgap for anybody that's going to slip between the cracks for the national championships and for the sanctional invites. However, what we're seeing now is I think a lot of people are starting to rely on that top 20 worldwide spot. And so when we yeah. look at sanctional invites, if you have earned one of those and you're in the top 20 worldwide, your spot is not going to be backfilled. Yeah, that's that's an area where we, I think we need to go and get a little bit more better clarification from because the understanding has been that um, you know so the, here's the here's the scenario right so if you're an athlete who qualifies as um, you know you, you receive an invitation by winning a sanctioned event like Dubai and you're Matthew Frazier and then you go on and you compete in the Open and you receive top twenty hypothetically speaking worldwide and so you're also receiving you're qualifying for the games via that method then at that particular moment bkg is actually the one who would receive uh, an invitation from dubai but if he goes on and competes at rogue which he's already accepted an invitation to compete at the rogue invitational and wins that event it'll actually be the second place athlete from rogue who will receive the invitation not BKG. So it does put athletes in a bit of a waiting game and a holding pattern to see, well, you know, if somebody goes out and competes in another event, am I going to actually get that uh, invitation or not? Um, a little bit of that will get fettered out in 2020 when the Open kicks off the season. Right now it's happening after four competitions. So it's a, it's a, it, five competitions, actually, now that I think about it. So it's a little bit janky this season here. Absolutely. And I think what we're, what we're starting to see here is the strangeness of the 2019 game season is starting to show just how out there the twilight zone is going to be for this season. Now we've, we, again, you and I have had these conversations and we have both reported on this is the idea that because the CrossFit games is now going to have a much larger field of competitors, they're going to be implementing elimination rounds. Like they're basically going to cull the field early on in the week. And then they're going to narrow it down. And both of us have heard the number of the top 10, although I, I, you know, we can't really put any weight to that right now. Both of us heard the number of the top 10. So they're going to narrow the field down to the best CrossFitters based off of those, those uh, qualification rounds. And then those athletes are going to be competing for, you know, at least half the week, maybe even the majority of the week. However, we have now seen that because the seeding is based on the open, even though no individual invited athlete who's won a sanctional needs to do the open, they absolutely should do the open because the seeding is based off of open performance. Right. So uh, we've kind of heard that rumor for a little while, which is, you know, there was a release that was sent out a couple of months ago along with announcing a sanction event that sort of articulated that, hey, you, if you don't want to do the Open, you don't have to, but we are introducing this concept of seeding. And, and so now what we've seen is they've codified that rumor and basically saying, yeah, it is going to have an effect on where you end up placing. So if you want to go to win a sanction event, congratulations, you're going to get your invitation. You can go chill for the rest of the season. Like Matthew Frazier right now, he doesn't need to do anything else. You can go, go into a deep, dark hole and train and then come out and do what he needs to do. But if you're an athlete who really cares about your seating position at the games and you want to be in a later heat in order to compete with athletes at your what you would consider to be at your caliber who's going to push your time and your performance then you're going to want to do the open because you're going to immediately be placed lower 
than every athlete that does the open if that's all you do is win a sanctioned event. And so now it really does reinforce the idea that you should be doing it. Now, again, 2020, the game is going to be different because the Open kicks off the season. So your national champions will be set. If they continue with the top 20 policy, the top 20 will be set. And then after that, it's everybody else. And it's it's another 15-plus sanctioned events where athletes have opportunities to, find, to, to, to earn an invitation to the games. Let's go ahead and talk about Wadapalooza. Yeah. While we don't know a lot of details about Wadapalooza, uh, we are about a week out of the, the start. Yep. You and I are actually going to be at Wadapalooza yes, we will. next week. So it's going to be, I think, uh, an interesting competition, a very exciting competition. Wadapalooza has always been, uh, you know, they, they use the festival of fitness as kind of their slogan yeah. or, or, or kind of a way of describing what's going on there. Yeah, it's a big celebration of fitness, and they, they do a lot, of, a lot of other events outside of just the main. They're also the most inclusive event. Too. They have the most. They have the broadest swath of categories of any of any event, not just of any non CrossFit event, uh, but of any event. You know, they have uh, ad- 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 multiple adaptive divisions. They have teen masters, and they have a whole swath of of open style. Uh, they have RX. They've got elite, and then they've got elite teams of three, and then they've got elite teams of four. So they, they really are the most inclusive event. So in the sense of being a fitness festival, they really do own it. And it's name. probably the largest gathering of CrossFitters and generally the fitness world outside of the games, which is if you can't go and, and, or, and, and you know, you can't experience that, I'm, I'm bummed for you already, but if you can go, you definitely should try and make it a point to get to Wadapalooza at some point, just because of how valuable that aspect of it is. Let's go ahead and jump into, even without the full rosters, some of the notable athletes that are going to be competing. And these, there's some names in here that we've known for a while now. For example, T. Claire Toomey has made it clear that she wants Wadapalooza to be her qualifying path to the games. Patrick Vellner has made it clear that he wants to use Wadapalooza as his qualifying path to the games. These are athletes that we've known for a while, but we're seeing some names pop up here, names that actually might throw a little bit of a wrench into those plans. For example, on the women's side, Sarah Sigmund's daughter is on that list, uh, and she's coming off of a fantastic performance yes, in Dubai. She yes, she is. Yeah, we've got on the women's side, um, I think these are the three really top athletes to watch here. you got Sarah Sigmund's daughter, Carrie Pierce, Tia Claire Toomey. Um, you know, uh, Carrie Pierce competed very, very competitive last year, and she's always, and she's currently the fittest U.S. athlete out there. Um, but Sigmund's daughter, she's warmed up for the season really well. She came off of her injury. Very impressive performance. I think she's in the upward swing of, of her trajectory right now. She got over um, a little bit of a rougher start than she'd wanted, but shored up a very, very strong finish in Dubai and is sitting pretty in third. And it's a very tight third. It, this was not third by a long shot. This was this was uh, this could have gone almost anybody's direction at the final event. And so she was sitting in a winning position going into the final event, put a lot of strength on her. She's a tough athlete and she's ready to do that. Tia Claire Toomey, though, honestly, um, She's coming in in a prize position. So whether, I don't know, um, usually athletes don't dust off the cobwebs with a major event. Usually they dust off the cobwebs with a, a, a lighter event or the open and then ramping up into regionals. So TBD on how that's going to affect her having ha- having taken such a long off season. Um, all, all, I think all indicators seem to point that she's going to be doing just fine. But, yeah. um, you know, uh, I don't know how many cobwebs can show up when your training partners are Rich Froning and Matt Fraser. Right, right, you know, it's, right. It's tough to it's tough to get yeah. rusty when you're training with the best crossfitters yeah, of all time. And, and Fraser, Fraser had said, you know, um, you know, right after when we interviewed him, right after he he won Dubai, that that for the last uh, several weeks, T had been down training with him in Cookville, and that he was going to be returning the favor, returning to Cookville and training with her as she's ramping up to Wadapalooza. So. <laughs> it doesn't sound like uh, doesn't like sound like she's been taking much of an off season. She's a tough competitor, so I, I expect good things out of her. On the men's side, I'm interested to watch not just Patrick Vellner, but also we have we have a couple of teammates, the training think tank duos right here, Travis Mayer and Noah Olson. And Noah Olson has won Wadapalooza multiple times in the past. And this is basically his backyard. I mean, he he did move to Atlanta for a little while. I think he's moved back to Miami now. So it's his backyard. This is his hometown crowd. It's where he started his CrossFit journey. It's where he developed into a games athlete. And you cannot rule that out in a man like Noah Olson who thrives off of that energy. Just being comfortable in his own space 
and also surrounded by friends and family, that's going to make a really big difference. Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree. I mean, Noah Noah is like, if I was going to say, okay, you know, who's, he's got the, it was like Jamie Green, the same argument I made for Jamie Green. She's local to the area. She knows the environment. She knows where to go. She's not going to have to disrupt his, his sleeping schedule or anything like that. And, and, and in his eating schedule and his coaches are right there. He's at home and he's comfortable, right? That's a, that plays when you're going to be at the top of the top and you're talking about getting a good night's rest and a good performance and a good kickoff to the event. He's no travel time at all. Those factors come into play here. And so I give him a little bit of a plus one, plus two in that area. And the fact that he's won this event so many times, he he, he really knows what he's doing. He knows his way around that, that, that event. And the style of events that Wadapalooza likes to do, some, some of these things involve no shoes. A lot of them involve water. Sometimes it rains. No is no stranger to that. Travis Mayer, again, we liked him at Dubai. We liked what he did. We thought he brought a seriously good performance coming off of an off year where he, where he didn't miss qualification by a couple of spots. Again, he's another guy that I'm like, that guy looks solid. He didn't, he didn't go up and do what he needed to do against a Matt Frazier and a BKG, but he, he, he increased his performance. He ended up in the top 10. I think it was with seventh overall. Is that what he was? Uh, seventh, sixth uh, overall. And, and, and so... Uh, we'll see what they can do against a Vellner. Vellner's a tough guy, and Vellner's the he's he's going to be the guy to to beat right now. And so I think this is going to be a really interesting and hopefully, in something we haven't seen in a while, is a really great final day of competition for the men's athletes. Really hoping for something that's very tight and, and it makes for for a really good watching and fan experience. So let's also, I mean, we've talked about the the pure chaos that is the team's competition at Wadapalooza. Yeah. The, the roster that they put together, the 10 pro teams that they invited, it, it, it is it is mind-blowing that some of these teams are even going to be able to function, because I, I don't think some of them even speak the same language. But There's language barriers all over there's the place absolutely, here. French, it's crazy Islamic, but English. What we, what we are seeing, though, and, and you know, I want to I want to kind of shy away from rehashing what we've talked about with the team. So, yes, Mayhem's going to be incredible, but also Invictus X is there. The other Invictus team, also known as Lesser Evil, which just qualified for the CrossFit Games, is going to be there. So that competition is going to no, be No, they tight. were invited. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They didn't qualify for the CrossFit Games. They got invited to the CrossFit Games via a win at the sanctional Dubai CrossFit Championships. Please, let's get our language right here, guys. Yeah, thank uh, you. What, what I do want to look at is a little bit of the programming. Now, we're a week out. Uh, you know, in true CrossFit event fashion, we know nearly nothing about what's going to happen, but we do have two events. And while on the individual side, there is some interesting things there, you know, most of them eat, both of them are a mix of, of gymnastics and weightlifting. And the, one of the events ends with a heavy ass snatch on both the men's and the women's side. It's going to be very exciting to watch. What I wanted to talk to you about is the team events, because I think we can finally say now that we are going to see team events at a sanctional. So far, so far we have, well, we had, uh, to be fair, at Dubai, I think we really had legitimately one team event, which was the final event, and that was very fun to watch. Outside of that, though, right now we are looking at two two events, uh, events number five and event number six for Wadapalooza. And the team event side, the Ocho Chipper, really quick, 20 synchro bar muscle-ups, 40 synchro deficit handstand push-ups. That's going to be very interesting to watch, especially if it's done on a parallel. 50-foot worm lunge, 20 synchro bar muscle-ups, 40 synchro deficit handstand push-ups with a 75-foot worm lunge, and then 20 synchro bar muscle-ups, 40 synchro handstand uh, deficit handstand push-ups, then 100-foot worm lunge. This is classic team CrossFit. Everything is synchro, and they've got a worm. This is this is mayhem in the bag right here. This is absolutely built for them, 100%. And this will be very interesting for athletes like Camille, who don't think has ever picked up a, wor a worm. Turi Helga Daughter, don't think she's ever picked up a worm before. Nick Uranker, maybe he's picked up a worm. And then Travis Williams. For that team specifically, I think we're going to see a little bit of a how well do they communicate when it comes down to it? Because this is all about communication and practice and execution. The Invictus team that's built mostly of individuals that won Dubai, they know each other. And CJ, their coach, is a very, very smart coach. And I guarantee you that when they were leading up to Dubai, they were already doing this kind of thing. Because there's no way he would have sent them there not having prepared with team events. So I think they're going to be in a much better position for, for that. But uh, this is classic team CrossFit for you right Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And, and, uh, Absolutely. I don't know. And the, the second I mean, <laughs> team event that we saw is the 
It's a heavy double unders, handstand walk, and then a max clean and jerk. It's two separate scored yeah. events. And, yeah. you know, I think one of the things that I want to make super clear here, seeing these two events makes me way more confident in the wager that I have with Travis Williams. Travis Williams and I have a wager that CrossFit Mayhem is going to either, in my opinion, take first or second. Really, they're going to take first. And in his opinion, they're going to take fourth or worse. Wow. And he says that there's no chance that teams of better individual athletes are going to lose to a team like CrossFit Mayhem, which is just basically built on the back of teamwork and living together. And of course, by the way, third place (laughs) is a push, which is never going to happen. So seeing these events makes me that much more confident in my wager of uh, everything going to, to charity. And, uh, you know, I guess we'll, we'll see exactly how that pans out. But with next week coming and even more information about this event and how the program is going to go, I feel like I'm only going to get more confident in this, Justin. No, I, 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 this second workout that we're seeing here definitely favors an athlete, uh, an individual athlete mindset, because, only, only really because of the obstacle handstand walk. The obstacle hands, a 20 foot obstacle handstand walk for athletes that have never faced it. And, and, and typically at the games, it's always been the individuals are subjected to the mo- to the worst apparatuses, the snail, the pig, parallel handstand walking course. That stuff is usually reserved for the individual athletes. And so on a team set, if you have athletes who haven't faced those obstacles or are a little weaker in certain areas, which is not uncommon, then I think that this could trip up teams that that are typically more, uh, they rise to the top because of their ability to participate as a team. This stuff has got to be done individually. And so um, I I could see, depending on how the rest of the, you know, if there are 10 workouts and it's five and five, going to make things a little bit interesting. Uh, Either way, I know that I'm going to enjoy watching it, but but it could make things a little bit more interesting. And so, uh, but I'm glad to see that we got some classic team events here because, you know, ultimately when they go to the CrossFit Games, they're not going to face... 15 individual events. 100% that, agreed. So. 100% agreed. And so let's go ahead and, you know, at the top of the show, I mentioned that both you and I are going to be at Wadapalooza. There's going to be tons of content being kicked out on Morning Chalk Up as well as Arm & Hammer TV about Wadapalooza and how everything is going. They do have a live stream. I think it's being serviced by Flow Elite, uh, you know, my, my previous yep. employers. And so, you know, you can pay. This is going to be a different experience yeah. i think for, this is not for some be of these free. some of these athletes uh, i'm sorry some of these spectators because we saw dubai has been a free uh live stream on youtube the games and uh and regionals were always free live streams on youtube or facebook you know the flow elite stream is going to be a paid subscription to flow elite you can play monthly you can pay yearly all those details i, I think we can probably talk about those next week uh there's there's obviously going to be an interesting reaction from the the fan base to that for sure but you know i just wanted to say i'm excited for wadapalooza i know that justin is excited for wadapalooza definitely and we're going to be there next week we're going to be pumping out a whole lot of content thank you so much everybody for watching on the minute and we'll see you guys next week